Good evening, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and our 41st Zoom meeting. Uh, it's a big number, and we're getting close to Christmas, uh, Brian. Uh, this is a third Tuesday in December, and I thought as Santa Claus is just round the door, that the speaker this evening could maybe talk to us about a subject that may just touch on the Christmas story in some, uh, maybe... Uh, some way. However, before I introduce Worshipful Brother Mike Neville, can I remind you all of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines that please keep your cameras on and a legible name in the screen so I know who you are. If you do have to go out off because of bandwidth issues, Bern, just drop me a little message. As ever, can I ask you to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages? So we've got a list of everyone who's attended for our future <coughs> history. So, Brian, without further ado, it gives me the greatest of pleasure to welcome back to our lockdown lecture series, Brother Mike Neville. And the floor is now yours, Mike. Yes, thanks a lot, brethren. So, um, just to give you some, uh, I'm going to speak about my book, Sacred Secrets, tonight. Uh, one thing I would say, though, is my commitment to Scotland. Here is my, uh, here's my Tam O'Shanter. Look at this. This is the what I wear when I'm. Uh, uh, I am the Commandant of Army Cadet Music. So uh, there you go. So there's a donation for charity. It'll go to the um, Music Cadets up, up in Scotland because there's some excellent pipe bands and some excellent uh, military bands. Uh, so I'm going to speak tonight about my book. And it was written, really, because um, I was frustrated about the ritual in the sense that I was um, speaking about things I didn't uh, know about. Uh, places, people, and, and the prizes in masonry go to regurgitating the words rather than understanding the meanings. And, and the other thing that um, I found is if you look around the faces on this Zoom, that how many of them are under 50, for example? And if you're over 50, then you probably went to church or a chapel or you went to Sunday school or the films you watch were, you know, Ten Commandments or um, Samson and Delilah. But the young man who joins the lodge today doesn't uh, have any of that uh, background. And yet we still give them the same. And one of the irritating things in English Freemasonry, they have all these pathetic rules about what tie you wear rather than what knowledge you have. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the uh, my slides. Um <clears throat> uh, Gordon, can I ask, can you still hear me? Yes, I can, mate. Give me a thumbs up. Yep. Thank you. Uh, yes, and so this is the talk th th this evening. So um, this is the areas I'm going to cover. And, and bear with me, because I am, uh, albeit I do come to Fife uh, regularly, I, I am an English craft mason, so there are some variations of ritual. But I'm going to speak about, of course, Genesis. Uh, secondly, uh, Exodus and the battles to secure Israel. Uh, the kingdom and the temple, uh, the death of uh, Solomon, uh, the New Testament. So Gordon alluded to that, like, the Christmas story. So there is, uh, you know, we're supposed, we're supposed to be de de christianized in England in 1813. They didn't do a very good job. And then what I'm going to say, what I think is the most important part of the Bible, but of course you, you may have some uh, uh, variations. It's, it's a matter of debate and research, really. And there are also uh, links to other degrees in, in, in Freemasonry, like uh, the chapter, Mark, Royal and Select Masters, these obviously vary in, in England and Scotland, but the stories are often told, uh, uh, mixed together in different ways. Um, so, the book of Genesis, now we say the first book of the Bible, because you'd be surprised to know how many young Masons don't really know that at all. Uh, but if we were to delve into it and to go into our, um, uh, to look into a, a craft ritual, who would be the first, in chronological order, who would be the first character from the bible to appear in craft ritual so if you delve into your minds who do you think that might be well in english freemasonry it's of course uh, tubal cain so tubal cain uh, is in the uh, chapter four of genesis and and what the bible is is it it tells the story it, it's very accurate in a sense it tells the story of the development of civilization but in a very simple way it tells it because there was oral traditions no one wrote these stories down and they were very simple folk so we know that metalwork took uh, thousands of years to develop. The Bible says Tubal Cain invented it. His brother invented 
farming. It, according to Jewish legend, his, daughter, his sister invented weaving. Um, and, and so it's, it's pretty accurate. I mean, the, fa the, the fantastic metalwork they did, reaching vast temperatures with, you can see on the right, the goat skin bellows reaching thousands of degrees to, to make metalwork. But uh, if we now go to who's possibly one of the most important men in the world, albeit he may be a legend, he may be a real person. This is, of course, Abraham. Why is Abraham so important? Well, he's, of course, the father of three great religions. So uh, Judaism, uh, Islam, and, of course, through Judaism, Christianity. So when you get these people um, blowing others up, saying, uh, my God's better than yours, they are, in fact, completely mad because they're all, in fact, worshipping the same one. And I went to a, um, a, a chapter in London, and the three principal chairs were a, a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim. Uh, and, and for all masonry's criticism, you find me other organisations that can achieve uh, such a brotherly love. And so if you look at Abraham, though, he, he started off in, I, I'm off to Iraq on Thursday uh, to work. So he started off in the city of Ur, which you can see uh, down the bottom in Iraq. And he was told by God to go to a place uh, and he went up to uh, up through the Fertile Crescent. As you can see the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, and to a place, uh, Beersheba, which is now in, in southern Israel um, and there he settled and of course uh, we know that he had um, a son Isaac and I always ask this question who who is sure they know how, how Abraham was so sorry I'll go back a bit so he's night he's 99 and he had a child now looking around this these zo this zoom there's a few of you on here who might be 99 I think now could could any of you cope with a newborn child I'm looking at Walter Bell there. I don't think Walter could cope. <laughs> maybe, Thank you. Maybe yes, maybe no. Thank so, you. Um, so th so the, how did God test Abraham's faith? Now, to many of us, this will be obvious stuff, but to many new masons, it's not. And, of course, he was told to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah. And, and you can see at the bottom, that is actually said to be the very stone where this happened. Of course, it was a test, and he eventually sacrificed a ram instead and he and Isaac lived on. I'll come back to where that uh, rock is in, um, in, in due course. Uh, but why is Mount Moriah so important to every Mason? Well, Mount Moriah, of course, is where ultimately King Solomon's temple was built. And then the second temple under Zerubbabel. So every time we do our little playlets, the degrees, one, two, three, and, and chapter and mark, we're pretending to be on Mount Moriah. That's where we're pretending to be. Uh, and just to show you how the Bible has influence on the world today. So uh, this is the story of the origin of the Ammonites. Now, the Ammonites in English, which well, I'm sure in Scottish as well, they appear on the second degree tracing board. Is this is this right in Scotland? Do they? Yes. No. You tell me. So the so the Ammonites um, have a nice evening. Sorry, my wife's just nipping out for dinner. Um, so the Ammonites in the Bible, they're almost like the, the tail baddies. Um, if you like Doctor Who, they're a bit like the Daleks. They always kick off, they always nearly win, get beaten, and, but they always come back for another go. If you like Sherlock Holmes, they're the Moriarty of the affair. But the Ammonites, what it said about the Ammonites is that um, Lot, who was Abraham's, um, uh, Abraham's nephew, he lived near Sodom and Gomorrah. His, uh, his daughters, they, they witnessed the destruction of the cities by fire and brimstone. His daughters, seeing this, thought the end of the world had come. There'd be no more um, uh, men. So they had sex with their father. Uh, and this product of this incest was Ben Ammon, the father of the Ammonites. So what the uh, Bible is saying, that these people are scum, really, and they deserve to die. It justifies killing them, really. Uh, and you think, why is this relevant today? Well, the capital of Jordan, of course, is... A man. So when people say, "How come they can't get over, over these things in the Middle East?" This, this, these, these slights and hatreds have been going on for three, four, five thousand years. Uh, here's me. I'm at the bottom there, trying to find uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm in the Dead Sea there. Now, of course, back to Isaac. So Isaac has two sons. I'm sure in your head, you know, uh, Jacob and Esau. He's, Jacob, of course, uh, cheats his brother out of his birthright. Uh, he wrestles with an angel, and God changes his name. God changes his name to Israel, he who struggles with God. So this is where the concept of Israel comes from. Uh, and um, if you look in the centre, that's an English uh, 
holy rollout chapter. The staves, the banners are either side, 12, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And who, how are they linked to Jacob? Well, they are 10 sons and two grandsons. There's a, there's a, a missing son, which is Joseph, him of the technical dream, dream cop uh, fame. Uh, and um, there's his ladder on the first degree trace board on the left. But um, what happens is, of course, remember the story, Joseph helps the Pharaoh stay the famine. And of course, all the family come to Egypt. And that's where Joseph and Jacob die. And this is the end of the book of Genesis. And we move on now to uh, Exodus, Exodus, of course, by the time of it. And if we remember, uh, for those old enough, if you remember Charlton Heston and Neil Brinner, this is where we find ourselves with the Ten Commandments right now. And, and so, um, and, and this is six, gener six or seven generations after uh, Joseph, um, and they've forgotten how the Hebrews helped them, and the, um, the consequences are that they use used as slaves. So, uh, and if you remember the story of Moses, so the, uh, the, the, there's getting too many Hebrews, so they decide to kill all the babies. His mother puts him in the basket, he's floated down the Nile, and he is uh, found by a princess and brought up as an Egyptian prince, and more critically for us, as a priest, because it says, uh, Stephen says in the uh, New Testament, that Moses knew all the secrets of the Egyptians. And this shines through, because if you think, when the uh, Jacob came to Egypt, they had, uh, the Hebrews had no name for God. They called him El Shaddai, God Almighty. They had no rituals and rites and ceremonies, no formal dress, no temple. And suddenly they go into Egypt and all these, all these uh, things become, start to be taken in. So, for example, when we say, where were you first prepared to be made a Freemason? We say, in my heart. Well, that is an ancient Egyptian belief. The, the heart is the truth. Uh, the heart is a repository of truth and wisdom. When you were mummified, they took out your heart and put it into a gold pot. When they pulled out your brain and flung it in the bin because it's rubbish. And so when we go so uh, to a chapter meeting in England or a, a communion service, holy communion service in uh, by the English prayer book, it says cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, which is weird, really. It should say cleanse the thoughts of our heads. But th this is an ancient Egyptian belief which has gone from ancient Egyptian into Judaism, into Christianity, into Freemasonry. So these are the ones. Now, if you remember that um, at about 40, the uh, Moses had a midlife crisis, but there was no sports cars to be bought in those days. So he, uh, he, he had a fight with, a, uh, with an Egyptian uh, slave driver, killed him uh, and fled into the wilderness of Sinai. Uh, and of course, the uh, God appeared before the burning bush. Now, on the left hand side, uh, that is me in St. Catherine's Monastery. I don't know if you've been there. This is the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, and that is what St. Helena identified as the burning bush, that very bush. Uh, what I found amusing, though, is that um, by the side of it is a fire extinguisher. Uh, so if God appears today, health and safety will do for him. He'll it, it, be put out. That's the thing. Finished. So, but God told him his name. Now, what did God uh, say his name was? Well, it's, in Hebrew, it's Y-H-W-H. OK, you put vowels into that and you get Yahweh, or if you translate it like Tyndale, you get Jehovah. But what does it mean? What does that word mean? Well, it means I am that I am. That's what that word, Y-H-W-H, -H, there's no vowels in, in Hebrew, of course. And he's told to go back into Egypt and bring the people out. Of course, this is, for those who remember, Charlton Heston and, and, and Neil Brin, and this is where it all kicks off, and there's the plagues. And eventually, and eventually they're freed. Uh, they uh, cross the Red Sea and uh, Moses goes back up Mount Sinai and he collects the Ten Commandments. Now, if you're going to if you're going to go up Mount Sinai, which I did, so that's me at the top. You can see the bottom, uh, a, youth, a youthful version of me at the bottom uh, right. If you're going to go up Mount Sinai, you must copy Moses and not me. OK, because Moses went on his own. I went with a woman who complained all the way up and all the way down. So just something to bear in mind. And just to give you an idea of the... Egyptian influence. Look at the bottom left. That is um, what they think the Ark of the Covenant look, look, look like. Okay. Bottom center is an artifact found in Tutankhamun's tomb. So you can see Egyptian influence going into Judaism. Uh, and here is 
when we talk about uh, tent or tabernacle, this is a model, and that is a tent or tabernacle. This is a model of it in, in Israel today. And of course, what was guided by? So again, you have to bear with me because in, in the English second degree ritual, it says the two pillars of King Solomon's temple were modeled on the pillars of fire and cloud, which guided the Israelites through the, the, the desert. So the pillar of fire and cloud guided them through. And when it stopped, they had to put up the mobile temple. And in it, uh, they put the um, Ark of the Covenant right at the back beyond three veils. So who built it? And, and again, in English chapter ritual, we say their names all the time, but people often say these things without any meaning. So who built it? Well, it was, of course, a holy ab and Bezalel. They're the ones who built it, and that's what it looked like. Okay, so Moses, though, dies. He's, he's not allowed to enter the promised land. His brother Aaron as well dies. And so that's the end of them. Who takes over? Joshua. Now, Joshua is a, is a name. It, if you read the Bible, it's often in the old versions, it's translated as Jesus because Joshua, Jeshua, and Jesus are all the same name. It's like Michael, Mick, Mike, and Mikey. They're all variants of the same. Okay, but Joshua was a good soldier. Uh, he was an Ephraimite. They were, if you second degree, they were told the Ephraimites are, 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 are violent, or they, they, they're, they're, good, they're, they're good soldiers, clamorous and turbulent people. And it brings me to my army days where you've got the five foot six inch jock who was the, he's always in trouble for fighting, but if there's a war, he'll win the VC. That's what, they, that's what these people are like. They're the, the best fighters, the, the best soldiers you could have, okay? Um, in my, in, in English craft lodges, of course, most of the second degree signs are done with the hand like this. Uh, but in my craft lodge, like this, like the Scottish version, we think in logic, which will our first, uh, perceptor for the whole logic ritual was a Scotsman. So we think so in England, most of the ritual centers on a battle where Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. In my version of English ritual logic, it's a it's a story where Mo on the left, Moses in the middle is still alive, and Ben Hur, that's not Charlton Heston, it's a descendant, you know, pre predecessor of him, and, and Aaron, who's got his rod, they have to hold his hands up. And it, it, as long as they hold his hands up, that they, they win. And if they put some down, they start losing. They have to hold them up. So this is why our sign is like the Scottish sign, palm thorn. But now we come to the time. Of, so after uh, Joshua, we come to the time of judges. Now, as a former sort of senior detective at Scotland Yard, I know that judges can be confused and not know who the Beatles are or think it's a good idea to give child molesters six months suspended sentence, but they're not that kind of judge, okay? Uh, these they're, they're sort of... Um, anointed leaders they're not kings so god says you're in charge so there's all there's all many uh, man, a manner of um, famous judges uh, gideon um, samson um, deborah gideon uh, but the most famous uh, judge say, in the craft english craft ritual is jephthah who's a, who's a general and jephthah um, he fights the as ever the ammonites uh, they're the Ammonites, and he, he says to God, if you allow me to beat the Ammonites, I'll sacrifice the first living thing that comes to my door. And of course, he, ex he expects it to be uh, sort of an animal or something, and it's his daughter. So it's a tragic thing. But the word that's used is the, is the, the word is so powerful of vow, you can't get out of it. And that's the same word as is used in the, for the first principles chair in this ritual. But at that time, there was, um, at the time of, of, of Jephthah, there was a, a very wealthy landowner um, who was married um, to Ruth. And he's probably, so who is this? Who is this, this man? Uh, and he's probably the word that's used most in Freemasonry. It's, of course, this man's name is Boaz. This is where Boaz, in, in the ritual, it says he's a prince and ruler in Israel. He wasn't a prince and ruler. He was a wealthy, very decent uh, Farm, farm uh, owner. But now we have um, the time of the kingdom. Now I don't, I don't know if you, I don't. Know if there's any Jewish Freemasons on here. Uh, so uh, a good friend of mine, Louis Keats, he helps me with the uh, ritual and the translation. And he always says, two Jews, three opinions." And, and they're always they go complaining to God and they say, "Look, we, we don't want this judge thing anymore. We want uh, we want a, a king like everybody else." And they go, and so eventually God appoints a man called Saul. So Saul is the first king of Israel, but he's a bad choice. He, he starts doing all sorts of uh, crazy things. He, he doesn't go along with what God says. So God says, I've had enough of him now. I've had enough of him. 
And so he, he sends the last judge. The last judge is Samuel. And Samuel, can you can see him in the on the right hand side with the horn in his uh, hand, and he says to him, "Go, go to the home of Jesse the Bethlehemite, and I am going to pick one of his sons as the future king." Okay, and of course uh, he lines up all the lads, big strong lads, and Samuel looks at the first one and thinks, "Look at this strapping lad here, handsome. Surely God has picked him." And this is where God says. I have refused him because God sees not as man sees. He looketh on the heart, not the outward appearance. And that is such an important lesson, I think, in life. And you get all this. I saw this Vicar of Dibley rubbish about the Black Lives Matter. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks inside at the heart. And that is, you know, then when people start ranting on about things, this is a good story, I think, a lovely story. But, of course, um, Saul is still the king, okay? And Israel is now invaded. It's invaded from the sea by the Philistines. And we all know that the champion of the Philistines was Goliath. And Goliath was you know, nine foot tall with a massive spear, big hat on, a bit bigger than my hat, looks better, better this big, I think, his hat. And uh, he, um, every day, he used to come out in front of the Israel, Israelite army and basically say, Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. And, and no one was hard enough to have a go. But David was visiting his brothers, you know, dishing out some food to his older brothers who were in the army. And he saw this go on and he said, well, I can kill a wolf or a bear if it attacks the sheep. So I'll have a go. And of course, he try and put on Saul's armor, but it's a disaster. It doesn't work. But he goes to the stream and he gathers five stones. Now, if you think those little pebbles, come with me to the British Museum in London and I'll show you what we're flinging at. They're like a cricket ball, really. And so if they if that hit you on the head, you could be 100 foot tall, you would go to ground because they would the, the, the speed they fired them out was like a flintlock pistol. That's how good it was. Uh, and of course, he advances towards the, the giant. And this has a link to the second degree ritual and the second degree punishment. So how is this linked to the second degree David and Goliath? Well, as he advances... Goliath says, if you don't clear off, I shall feed your carcass to the ravening birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field. And, and uh, David says, have some of that, and kills him, chops his head off. And this is why I put this picture of this Rowan Williams, who was the uh, Archbishop of uh, Canterbury. Um, now, I met this man, and I think he's living proof. I used to think that um, intelligence was a linear scale. So you've got very clever people here and really thick people at the other end. That's not so much. But I've, I've since realised in life, it's actually a circle. So you can be so clever, you are in fact daft. And I've met this man and he is in, of that ilk. He is so clever, he's daft. And he, he alleged, bearing in mind his father is a, a Freemason, he said that the Masonic ritual was satanically inspired. It's not satanically inspired. It's all from the Bible. So he needs to learn that. And I, I put this to him, and he, he sort of, when you challenge him, he sort of flees, flees his life. But then, moving on. So um, Saul dies, eventually dies fighting the Philistines. And he dies in a famous way, which shows us how the King James Bible influences. And I think the King James Bible was decided, that was, that was proposed in five, wasn't it? I seem to remember. But anyway, the King James uh, Bible, this is, these are how the words still carry today. So how was Saul killed? Well, he was going to be he was going to be taken prisoner with his sons, Jonathan and the like. And instead of being instead of being taken prisoner, he fell on his own sword. That's where that phrase that's used after after every general election comes in. Okay, so David becomes the king. He captures uh, Jerusalem, makes it the capital city, moves the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh. That's why that name often that word often features in the Sonic ritual. It's like Shiloh. It's moved to Jerusalem. And, and um, he, but he upsets God. Firstly, upsets God. Number one, by counting the fighting men, and it's quite unclear really why this upsets God. But it, they think it's a matter of pride. But God sends the angel of death, who carries on uh, killing people until it reaches the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite. And that's what it is. Now, why, who's so? What's a Jebusite then? Because lots of people say that. Well, Jabus was the name of Jerusalem 
before it was captured. So it just means a rawner must have lived there before it was uh, taken by. And But that threshing floor is the same place as where Isaac was going to be sacrificed. It's Mount Moriah and it's where the temple's going to be built. But David wants to build a um, temple, but God forbids him because he says, your you know, reign has been full of blood and lust. And if you if you look at, read it really, the Bible, if you if you like, say, The Godfather 2, where Michael Calion takes over, it, it literally is like this. So, and God, so, and so he gets, um, David gets old and he gets cold. And uh, I don't know how many brethren on here are widowers. I don't know if you get cold at night. I don't know what methods you use of keeping warm, perhaps an electric blanket or maybe put an extra bar on the electric fire or whatever you do. But what's the biblical method of keeping an old man warm? Much more preferable, I suggest. They uh, slip a young virgin into bed. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can see Walter smile there. Th this is the unfortunately named Abishag. Um, but the bad is that, uh, that nothing happened. So, but it, it's the finish of him. It's the way to go, I suggest. But uh, who writes this stuff? But, uh, but there we are. So King David's dead. And after some shenanigans, of course, uh, Solomon becomes the king. And Solomon builds uh, the temple. What do we know about the temple? Very little, really, if you look at the Bible. So it tells us about the two pillars, names them. It tells us about the, uh, the, the, the brazen sea, which is a big bowl of water in, in front. The idea, though, and this is mentioned in the English second degree tracing board about people worshipping like it's a church. It's not like that at all. You worship outside. It's hot weather. The inside is for the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant you can see there, which contains a pot of manna, Aaron's rod, uh, and the writings uh, of the law. That's all. That's that's right at the back. OK, now um, there are no uh, globes on the pillars. What they think was on the top of the pillars is a galuth. Uh, which is a bowl where you put some oil in it and set fire to it. So it looks like the pillar of fire or cloud, depending if it's day or day or night. But where, where is the um, Ark of the Covenant now? So if you're uh, Jewish, it's said to be in Mount Nebo. That's where Moses uh, was buried. Christian, well, in the book of Revelation, it says it's in heaven. But is that in the future or is it now? Or is it in Ethiopia or whatever? But all I can advise you as a uh, former police officer is if you do find it, don't touch it. It'll have serious implications on your health because the Philistine, it was not only just a religious artifact, it was a military standard. So like we have uh, colours for infantry regiments, big flags, they would march with that uh, into battle. And the Philistines captured it, but after six months they gave it back because God inflicted on them a dreadful medical condition. And many of you on here will have suffered this medical condition. It was in fact piles but worse than that god said you have to make gold copies of the piles as tribute so somebody brethren had to sit on the hot wax mold so if you've got piles just remember it could always be worse and you could be a philistine sat on the hot wax mold but there we are so um here's so here's a little bit as an englishman i can take pride in this you see and and rub, rub your scottish noses in it that a tiny bit of the uh, temple may have been from England, okay? Because in the, in the King James Bible and in the Masonic ritual, it uses the term brass. It wasn't brass at all, it was bronze. It was the Bronze Age. And so, um, where do, so where'd you get it from? So uh, bronze it is made from copper and tin. Copper is, is locally sourced. Cyprus means the island of copper. That's where copper comes from, but tin, may well have come from England, so from, from Devon and Cornwall. We know that they were trading in tin to the to the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians, that's around Tyre, the Lebanon, the modern day Lebanon, they would sail through the pillars of Hercules, that's Gibraltar, trade in tin. So, so for example, in Cornwall, there's a place which is spelt Mosehole, but it's pronounced locally Mosul, like Mosul in Syria. And it means in Phoenicia, Phoenician fresh water place. So that's probably where the Phoenicians got their fresh water before they sailed off again. Okay, that's, and they found tin ingots in rivers there, in, in, the, in the rivers, sailing out to the port, from a thousand years before Solomon. The bottom picture, uh, bottom left, is from uh, the Royal Exchange in London. It shows Phoenicians trading with Cornishmen. Okay, and if we remember on the right, we've got King Solomon, 
but we've got Hiram, King of Tyre, and Hiram Abiff in the middle. Of course, King uh, Hiram, King of Tyre, was a Phoenician. Hiram Abiff, we know, remember, read the Bible. His mother was of the tribe of Dan. Also, she was of the Nephtali tribe from the city of Dan, and his father was from Tyre. So he was half Phoenician, okay? And it says in the ritual that the once it was brought to Jerusalem, the, the, the bronze makings, it was cast in the clay grown between Zuccoth and Zeredatha. Well, where is that? Where are they? Well, look at this map here. So you, if you look north, if you look from north to south, you've got the River Jordan. It flows down through the Sea of Galilee, okay? Uh, in uh, in CC Square, Sea of Galilee, down, 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 right into what's called the Salt Sea, which we know as the Dead Sea. Halfway along, it, the River Zuccoth, uh, so the River Jabbok, fly, flows in as a tributary to the uh, um, the, the Jordan, and Zuccoth and Zeredatha are in that where that confluence is. And if you look at the bottom left, that's what it looks like today. It must have been good because it's forty miles uphill to Jerusalem okay and so what we think they did with the pillars is they cast enormous rings hollow but they had to roll them up the hill and when they got to the top they stacked them up like a child's stacking toy and that's how the pillars were, were made hollow and this might be all that's left of the temple you remember there's uh, all the pomegranates around the pillars well that, that might be one of them but Solomon dies. Um, like his father, who had a weakness for women, he even bonking Ammonites. Unbelievable. Uh, and uh, so God said, well, I'm going to the kingdom off you. I'll take it off your son. And who takes over from Solomon? I'll be very impressed if anybody can tell me this. It is, in fact, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, he wrecks Israel. So the kingdom that's been built up by David, and he's going to wreck it. Um, and so what happens is um, he, he says, uh, right, my father tax you. I'm going to tax you sort of double. You're going to fight, feel how hard it is. And he sell, sends an elderly tax collector to tax the people. And that elderly tax collector, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong here for Scotland, but in the English ritual, he is the last biblical character you learn about in the craft. And it is, in fact, Adoniram. Okay, and of course, he features in the mark as well, doesn't he? Adoniram, you can see him in the um, uh, in the right hand side. So he di dies a good death for a mark mason. They stone him to death. That, that's the finish of him. Uh, but the consequence of Rehoboam's greed is that ten of the tribes break off and form the northern kingdom of Israel. You can see it in dark green on the left, leaving Judah and Benjamin alone as the light green kingdom of Judah with the Jerusalem as its capital. The dark green bit eventually become the Samaritans, uh, but they're, they're, they're constantly feuding. It's like um, North and South Korea, uh, but while they're feuding, they're filled with it. They're covered by enemies. You can see on the left in gray, the, the Philistines are there, yeah? Uh, the Ammonites in light blue, okay? But worst of all, in the North, in dark blue, the Assyrians. The Assyrians are the SS of the Bible. They're absolutely brutal. They rule by fear. Every, they publicize it. Uh, they kill people brutally. If you go to the British Museum, uh, on their freezes, it's got pictures of them throwing, uh, catch, throw, playing catch with other people's heads, you know, and putting people up on stakes and all sorts of, but this is how they rule by fear. And they threaten the uh, kingdom of Israel. And eventually, despite all the warnings of the prophets, eventually they're, they're taken away and they take them away and they mix them in with all the other um, Assyrian uh, parts and this is why uh, the uh, basically the, the, Ju the, the Judeans say well you, you're, you're bastards really you're all mixed up you know you're not part so this is where the hatred between the um, Jews and Samaritans uh, would eventually come from so the north conquered uh, but a greater power is no bigger and better than Assyria is now uh, mobilizing itself. Very short lived, only about 70 years. But the next great power in the Middle East is the Babylonians. Okay, so the Babylonian Empire, you can see Babylon here. So it stretches the entire First Arc Crescent. And again, you'll have to for forgive me if I get this slightly wrong, but in, in the English chapter ritual, what happens is uh, what, what we're told is that the um, the Babylonians captured Jerusalem quite quickly 
Uh, they take away the king, Jehoiakim, uh, and take away his, his household to Babylon. And what they do, they install his uncle, who's called Mataniah, uh, on the throne in Jerusalem. They say, look, you now work for the Babylonian Empire. Uh, if you mess us around, we'll come and kill you. You're you, you absolutely loyal to us. And to make you aware of this loyalty, we'll change your name to Zedekiah, which means the justice of Jehovah, which you will get if you cross us. But the moment they're gone, Zedekiah cuts into the neighbouring empire of Egypt and tries to make a deal that they'll help him push the Babylonians out. So the, the Babylonians get wind of this and they send a mighty army under a man called Nebuzaradan. Now, if you're wondering why everybody in Babylon seems to have a sort of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, there, Nebu is a god. So it's like a prefix to your, to, to your name. Like being called Sinclair or something like that, St. John or whatever. Um, and we know these events are real. In the middle, that piece of pottery in the middle is a message sent during the Babylonian invasion. And it says, I mean, it sort of wrecks the chapter story, really, because it says, I hope our Lord Jehovah sends peace. It's a message sent at the time between two army commanders, Israel commanders. But uh, all the cities of, uh, of, uh, Ju of Judah are besieged. That's uh, Jerusalem in particular. Lakesh, is a, Lakesh, there's lots of artifacts been found about that. So we know it's a real uh, event. And eventually, after 18 months, the Babylonians smash down the doors of Jerusalem, rush in and of course as they rush in Zedekiah and his sons whew, they're out of the back because they know they're gonna that's the end of them but they flee but they're eventually captured and we see on the left the man stood in the middle is General Nebuzaradan and the man being held up with his arms like this that's Zedekiah and he's forced to watch as all his sons are killed in front of him by the Babylonians and then they burn out his eyes so it's the last thing he sees chain him up in fetters of, of brass and take him to Babylon. And th then they smash down the temple. This, this is when Jeremiah tells us that the pillars were hand's breadth in thickness when they smashed down. They set fire to it. They this is when the Ark of the Covenant disappears, all sorts of artifacts. Um, and this is the great conflagration this is, uh, that's mentioned in the English and maybe the Scottish Royal Arch uh, ritual. And all the, uh, so, and that's who, again in, in the chapter. We scorn to be descended from those who basically fled. Well, who basically fled? Zedekiah. And there, um, all the Jewish nobility, anybody of consequence has moved back to Babylon. And you think they're now going back nearly to where Abraham started in all. Um, and, but this is an important, this is a very, very important time, the exile in Babylon, this by the rivers of Babylon. Because this is when they start to write down the scriptures as we know it. So if you're... Jewish is very important because this is when the Hebrews become Jews. If you're Christian or Muslim, this is when they start to write down the scriptures that we use today. Okay, uh, it's also a time of prophet Ezekiel, for example, had a bizarre vision of God when he was there. You can see it on the left. He envisaged God coming down to earth in almost a spaceship. You read Ezekiel one; it's like a spaceship coming to earth. But there's four wheels, and on the four wheels, it's got. Um, the faces of an angel what the what the faces of four faces of an angel a lion a man an ox and an eagle okay and also ezekiel has a vision of seven steps leading to a new temple okay um with a river running by so that's the english second degree tracing board in front left and hopefully the same it's got one but it, is that king solomon's temple or is that ezekiel's vision maybe we don't know but the babylonian empire ends with uh, this is a, symbolized by this story. I went to see this in the uh, National Gallery in uh, Trafalgar Square. This is Rembrandt's Belshazzar's Feast. Okay, so King, uh, King Belshazzar is the third in charge of Babylon. And a uh, feast, he says, look, all that stuff we nicked from Jerusalem. So all the holy vessels that Hiram and Bifford cast in Zuccoth and Zeridatha, they had them. And he started to toast all the false gods and all this sort of thing. And the hand appeared upon the wall and wrote, Meany, meany, tekel, up, passing. They go, they go down like that. So you can see the same ones, meany, meany, tekel, up, passing. What do these mean? All the Babylonian priests can't tell him. So they call in Daniel, him of the lion's den. What does this mean? Meany, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, like shekel. Thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting. And up, passing. 
God has divided your kingdom between your enemies. And that night, Belshazzar's dead. The Babylonian Empire is finished. They think one of the things that helps here, the Tigris wasn't flooding. And so the moat around the city wasn't filled. Uh, and uh, who takes over? The Persians. Okay, vast of that empire under uh, Cyrus the Great. And uh, one of the things I em emphasize is there's me on the bottom left. That is uh, the Cyrus Cylinder in the British Museum. They, these people are real. We need to show young masons this. They, they're not myths. These are, that's, that's the first charter of human rights. In, in there as well is, is a cup used by Nehemiah. Okay, so we, these are real people. They're not just made up things. But of course, um, they, and then they build a second temple, which was completed in the reign of Darius, Persian ruler, under Zerubbabel. If you're not in chapter, this is why you should join, because this was all on boat. Uh, this isn't destroyed, but it's desecrated by the next invaders, who are the Greeks, okay? Under, remember Alexander the Great? Uh, and they, this ends up in a Maccabean revolt, and there's an independent Jewish state for 100 years, until the coming of the next invaders, of course, the Romans. Now we get to the you know, story of, of Christianity and uh, very relevant with Christmas. And of course, in the middle there, that's a model of what the second temple looked like. Now, that is the extensions to it were done by Herod. So, of course, in the nativity story, Herod is a, is a baddie. But he actually, as far as the temple goes, he, he, he did a good job in extending it. But that's the same temple where... Jesus uh, turned out the moneylenders. Of course, we could do it in back with all this Wonga.com and all this greedy swines coming around. Uh, but this is the te this temple wasn't going to last. Uh, in uh, there was a, another revolt in 70 AD. Titus, who you can see on the right, was then a, a general. Eventually became the emperor. He um, destroyed the temple. They don't think he meant to do it, really, but somebody probably threw a firebrand in there, set fire to it. But what's interesting is all the money gold and they nicked from Jerusalem that's what financed the building of the Colosseum in Rome okay and if you look on the bottom left that's me in front of the arch of Titus in Rome in the ancient city and there's the frieze in the middle where you can see that this is if you remember Ben-Hur uh, when they have the big parade with the the, uh, the victorious consul this is the same they have their parade and uh, look the soldiers are carrying the menorah candlestick okay the square thing on the right with the two crosses like that, the cross things like that, that's the trumpets of Jericho. The square thing is the table of the showbread where the, the ritual bread was placed in the Holy of Holies. That was made of gold, so you can see that six soldiers are carrying it, okay? Uh, and the menorah candlestick, so when the state of Israel used that as their emblem, that's on the right, so that's in Jerusalem, they copied it. That's the only one of the only pictures in the world of the menorah candlestick on the Arch of Titus in Rome. And what would we see if we went back to Jerusalem today? Remember, I spoke about the uh, the stone where Isaac was going to be sacrificed, the threshing floor of Iran, where the first temple was built, where the second temple was built. There it is under the dome of the rock, an Islamic shrine where they think that, where they say that Muhammad went up to heaven on a, on a white horse flying horse uh, there's me in front of the um wailing wall the remains of the second temple i went there you, you, i don't even know, you put a prayer in the wall and every six months they come with the holy hoover the holy hoover comes takes them all away but when i was there i put my prayer in the wall and i was trying to be all religious and uh, a very pious uh, jew was there you know praying against the wall like this and his phone went off it had the star wars theme it sort of ruined the moment so if you do go to the uh wailing wall do, do turn off your mobile phone um, and so in conclusion brethren the um i hope i've shown you that that rock that's in genesis it's there now you know you can go and see it go and touch it. i recommend these things to you. some parts of the bible of the ritual of sonic ritual are incorrect you know there's no globes at the top of the pillars and this sort of stuff but of course freemasonry is veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols which means you can make any old nonsense up you want and you'll just have to accept it of the nearly uh, 1,200 chapters I found in the King James Bible, I found over 460 of them in the ritual, some mention of it, okay? What I think the most influential part is, well, if you look at uh, St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews, okay, chapter 11, it's a sort of summary of the Old Testament. And I really do think that's where the, a lot of the ideas of who to include in the ritual came from. You might have other ideas, but I commend you to have a read of it. And so that's my uh, 
tail. Uh, there's my details. I haven't got any copies at the moment, but you know, always think about buying books. Okay, you always think about buying a book off me. Keeps Mrs. Neville the third happy and Mrs. Neville the second away from my door. And so uh, there we are. I'm going to escape. And I do lots of these lectures. There's lots of other ones. So if you do want any more, the cost is a donation to a charity of my choice. Mike, worshipful brother Mike Neville, thank you so much for that very enlightening and I would say inspirational and spiritual talk on your book, The Sacred Secrets. I think many of the brethren here present were uh, rewinding back to primary uh, Sunday school days <laughs> in their short yeah. trousers with uh, the yeah. fire and brimstone minister of uh, oh, Scotland <laughs> and we possibly have a couple of wee freeze on here oh, as well okay. from up north Mike uh, but before I go to the the, the questions that I know will be in the chat uh, there was just a couple of things that I, I, I picked up that I think is one of the things I felt that you said you mentioned that we're, you were talking about real people and we should yeah talk to our young masons uh, about these real people and I think that's something that we probably don't do enough and the, the other one was when you were talking about uh, the bronze and I'm not sure if you uh, and I'm sure you are you've been a retired uh, policeman uh, the 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 infamy of Scotland's third national drink obviously we've got whiskey and iron brew <laughs> but then there is the Buckfast and right, okay. uh, Buckfast Abbey was right in the center uh, of where that bronze was coming from so yeah, who knows yeah. uh, they might have all been high on the Buckfast <laughs> when they went back uh, overseas or that's what gave them the sustenance to <laughs> uh, for that journey back so, but uh, so, Mike, going to the, the questions, let's have a yeah. quick scan down to see what we've got. I did see one, uh, a couple coming in there. Uh, Brother Stevie Chalmers uh, reminds us that there is a, a wonderful memorial to Tubal Cain in Edinburgh, in the Newington mm -hmm. area. So I think the next time you're up, Mike, if you've never seen this, this statue there, it's something will get you. Uh, and then uh, David Purvis, who's a... Uh, one of your musicians, friends, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nicholson Square. So Nicholson Square in Edinburgh is a place Would, to visit. I mean, just to say, Gordon, I'll be up in, um, hopefully in, in Easter time, I'll be in Edinburgh because um, the Pipes and Drums uh, ca um, camp will be at Redford Barracks. So I'll be up there uh, then. So perhaps we could get together. Be lovely. Yeah, definitely, because the, my work's still at Redford Barracks as well. So okay. uh, we'll certainly do something along that. Uh, so a question uh, from past master Ron Mann. I thought Hiram Abiff wasn't mentioned in the Bible. Uh, oh, no, no, absolutely. So what, so, sorry, Gordon. So he's mentioned in, in Kings and Chronicles feature the same things. So, uh, 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 Chronicles is like, is like Kings with the dirty bits and horrible bits taken out. And, and what you've got in, in uh, Kings is Hiram Abiff, okay? And in um, the Chronicles is Hiram with a U, that's because there is no vowel. So you have to, you know, it's like saying, you know, where I come from in Bolton, they say book uh, and it, 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 down in the South, they say book, you know, cause it, it, there's no, you wouldn't know if it's Hebrew. Uh, the abif they think means a buy. So my daughter is Abigail, which means a father's joy. Abby is father. So the, what they think Hiram Abif means is uh, hi, not dad, but Hiram, the man I respect, a father figure. So definitely mention, and it clearly says, as I say, his mother of the tribe of Neftali from the place of Dan, which if you look on my maps is in the north, and his father was from Tyre. So he, he had his mother's religion, but his father's, the people from Tyre were very skilled at, at making things. The, the, one of the things, like, what, the reason we have purple robes for emperors, they were skilled at mixing the dye from sea slugs it was easy to make red and blue, but not make purple. That's why purple was so rare. So the people of, of Tyre were very skilled craftsmen in engraving, in dyes, in woodwork. So absolutely mentioned in those books, uh, Kings and Chronicles. Okay. I, David Brown, the right worship master of Lodge number 76. I've thought for a long time that a ritual assumes a level of biblical knowledge that our candidates, like people generally, no longer have. As Brother Neville shows, we may have to think about imparting that knowledge ourselves. 
So, Gordon, I agree. So, what I would say to that is it's like in the army cadets. So, we have a cadet who plays the bagpipes, okay? So, you have to learn a simple tune on the chanter before you move on to Scotland the Brave, before you move on to something more complicated. What we've done in Masonic Ritual, we've assumed that everybody can play Scotland the Brave and moved on to very complicated stuff rather than giving them the basics. And because whereas 50 years ago, people would have come in with the basics, they're not anymore. Yeah. They don't go to church, they don't go to we were giving them and i find the royal arts the most complicated one so that is my daughter abigail in the background <laughs> hello abigail welcome <laughs> to the kingdom of faith <laughs> uh, I, another one <laughs> I, most biblical scholars now reckon that the letter to the hebrews was not written by paul due to significant differences in style from the other pauline epistles as well as dating difficulties what's your view on that Absolutely, you know, you know, with, with the tax of the, the let some of the letters, it's hard to put them together. But up to a point, we've just got to accept these things at face value. Whoever wrote that letter, um, that's I just suggest that chapter eleven is that it's a, as I say, a summary of the Old Testament, very useful for for Freemasons. I suppose it's a bit like Jack the Ripper. It's probably better not knowing, isn't it, really? Um, yeah, it adds the mystique and the and the and the faith. So I, I don't disagree. We will. It's probably it may not, but we'll never know, will we? Maybe I had an off day and wrote a different style. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, there are as you would expect, Mike, a huge amount of thank you and applause for you in the chat box this evening. Uh, Stephen O'Donnell comments: Hiram means born high in standard Hebrew. I. Uh, learned lecture i uh, eagle errol mortensen do you get the masonic bible in your third degree in the uk and scotland i uh, i think some do eagle some get presented when they go to the chair it's very much it's not given as standard out to anyone i uh, i remember my, I, when i went to the chair it was my installing masters presented me with my my own personal masonic bible but yeah. Others have got their own stories, how they've come across theirs. So, right. uh, we, we normally do it up to the third degree, but it, each lodge varies, doesn't it, really? Yeah, I think that's to do with the, the history and tradition of that lodge. So, yeah. uh, Mike, once again, on behalf of the Lodge Hope of Karachi and everyone here this evening, thank you once again. Uh, you, you are a very skilled presenter. And as a few of the, the Bren have commented on, you've got that lovely... Le level of humor that just at times takes edge away from a very serious subject so thank you very much and can i wish you your family the very best for the forthcoming festive season i um, brian uh, before we come to the end and we unmute uh, our normal uh, announcements of what's happening next, uh, next week uh, we will have uh, Brother Andreas Onifers, the Master of Quater Coronati, with us uh, and he will give us uh, an insight into the Swedish Rite. Uh, Andreas was due to be with us last week, but unfortunately he couldn't be. So he has assured me he will be with us next Tuesday evening. So we look forward to, to that. I've thought long and hard, Bern, about what I should do during the intervening period between Christmas and New Year. I think uh, a few months ago I said we, we would take a break for the Christmas period. Uh, but listening to what's happening in the world and, and it comes back to what Mike was saying, that there are many of us are uh, living on our own. Uh, I've felt that we should continue meeting and there will be a meeting uh, the Tuesday in between. Uh, we will dedicate that as a sort of St. John's Day meeting. And I, I went to great expense of uh, I bribed a, a, a friend of mine to get an email of a friend of a brother uh, to come along and speak to us. I, it's not the lecture I wanted him to speak to us about because he's not pulled that together, but he has promised that he will come back in the future and do it. However, I'm delighted that we will have the Honourable Adam Bruce come and speak to us uh, the middle Tuesday between Christmas and New Year. Uh, that, uh, for those who don't know who the Honourable Adam Bruce is, that's his, the son of Lord Delgan, who I'm sure you're all aware of. And uh, I think he is still in the chair of our sister research lodge, uh, Robert Murray, through in Edinburgh. Uh, Adam works in the 
a green revolution, a wind farm and technology like that. But he's going to talk about industrial revolution through the green revolution and connect it to Freemasonry. So please join us uh, on that Tuesday evening. Brian, at this point, I will allow you to unmute yourselves and please give a, a warm thank you to Brother Mike Neville once again for his presentation and interpretation of Sacred Secrets. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, and a happy so home day to yeah. all my brethren yeah. in Scotland. Thank you. Absolutely thank fabulous you. tonight. Uh, thanks, Mike. Excellent. Yeah, well thank done, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank well thank you, Mike. Thank you. Absolutely. Well done, Gordon. Cheers, Mike. Thank you. Merry thank Christmas. Thank you very much, Gordon. Pleasure, Claudia. Fantastic. Mike, that was thank absolutely super. So thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it. Many thanks. Yeah, as usual. Very good. Thanks very much, Mike. That was a very interesting lecture. Thanking you. Thanks, You're Gordon. Welcome. Cheers, man. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. That's an excellent lecture once again. I heard you the one on Crime and the Craft as well. Both top-notch. Excellent. Thank you very oh, much. Cheers, Tony. Thank you. Excellent lecture. I'm away to your order. I'm over in Ashton Underline. Enjoyed every minute. <laughs> cheers, Aidan. Thanks again, Mike. I'll thoroughly enjoyed it again. Second <laughs> lecture of have seen of yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gordon, for arranging it once more. Cheers, Alec. Excellent. Take care, Mike. brethren. Stay safe. Was it as, as a resting as usual? Thank you. <laughs> okay, Brian, I'll give you five. Thank you, Mike. That was an excellent presentation. Unfortunately, I lost the internet for 20 minutes, so I've got to watch on the video. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. That was yeah. an excellent presentation. Well done. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Thank you, Gordon. And wish you all, brethren, a very, very safe Christmas time. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother Brian. I'll give you four. <laughs> right, I'm going to go for my dinner. So I'm going to I'll see you all. Right? That's it. Four. Good night, three. everybody. Stay safe. Well done, Mike. Well Thank done. you, mate. Thank you. See you next time, mate. Well done, Gordon. Thanks, Gordon.